Hey now, and welcome to the 21st episode of the Help Find the Others podcast. If you've been with us all along, welcome back. But if this is your first time listening to us, well then welcome. I don't have a quote for tonight's episode, but Stan's on the line. How you doing, man? Good. So this was a pretty good talk. This was uh, our first PhD guest, and it was Dr. Balaz Zaghetti. And he is a lead researcher for the self-blinding microdosing study that I am going to be partaking in in a couple months. And I wanted to have him on to have him explain the study a little more and just talk psychedelic research. And uh, hopefully it, this episode was interesting enough that it, it urges some of you guys out there to to join in the study and, and throw your your data in the ring. Uh, do you think uh, after talking with him, Stan, do you think that you might do the, the study? Absolutely. Just need to secure the goods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the only question mark right now, but... I think I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. I really think it's important for as much as we talk on, on this channel and podcast and everything. I think it's really important to do what we can to, to move the research along. And, and hopefully this episode urges people to do that. And, and hopefully it's very informational. Yeah. I, I think that's the key is we're seeing these laws change and to change the laws, you need to have the research and the data. Otherwise, the lawmakers aren't really uh, looking over that way. So throw your ring in the hat and, and let's uh, make some real change here. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Balaj the Giddy. So how are you doing there, man? I'm doing good. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, great. I'm glad to have you on and... Um, we had you on, um, well, you messaged me about spreading information about the self-blinding microdosing study that you were one of the researchers on. And uh, so I made a video and, and I imagine that most of the people listening to the podcast uh, right now have, have seen the video. So this is kind of a, a follow up to that and, and to go more in depth and to, you know, let you kind of just explain, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of the study and then just to have some questions that. Stan and I have, and 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 also uh, some people from our Discord channel have some questions. So, yeah, why don't you just you know give us the uh, the gist of, of the study? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so what we're doing it's called the self blinding microdose study, and uh, basically what is it trying to do? That it is one of those internet based studies that have been uh, uh, that you see many of them about microdosing. So just like many other studies, this is an internet-based study. People who are participating, they're recruited through the internet. And all of the testing is done through the internet. And that is important because it means that this is a global study uh, that anybody can participate in. And these sort of studies have been done uh, with respect to microdosing. But what is the, the novelty and the innovation of our study is that people who are signing up for our study, they have to go through a, a setup process. And basically what the setup process accomplishes is that it self-blinds you, it introduces a placebo control into your microdosing regime. And I don't want to get lost in the details of how exactly the setup works. We actually have a very detailed video on the website about it, and there is also a PDF manual which uh, uh, spells out all of the steps in a very detailed manner. But what the basic trick is, is that people who are doing our study uh, they are going to hide their microdoses, uh, small pieces of blotter papers, in non-transparent gel capsules. And then obviously the placebos are going to be just empty gel capsules. And then the setup process is a little bit more involved in that, because if people were just taking these capsules without knowing which one contains which, then we would not be able to retrospectively assess the effects of uh, microdosing. We, we needed a way to recover that information, which capsule was a microdose and which capsule was a placebo. So anyway, there is like a lot of like, you know, putting the capsules into envelopes and then you also put in some QR codes. And then during the experiment at various time points, people have to scan those QR codes and that's going to display uh, basically a four digit code that allows us, the researchers, to basically figure out when the given participant was taking a placebo versus a, a, a microdose. So this element of the placebo control is really the, uh, uh, the key of it. And... Uh, 
I think what is often uh, you know underappreciated is that that's really one of the, the key questions regarding uh, microdosing. Microdosing has really became this phenomenon in the past uh, I don't know five ten years or so. So there's not a whole lot of scientific studies on it. So if right now I go and talk to a colleague uh, about microdosing, then they are likely to be skeptical about it. And, and there are good reasons that there have only been a handful of studies that has been done about it. And many of them have been these basically unblinded internet-based survey studies, which are a good starting point to getting to know uh, uh, microdosing. But you basically want to do that, that next step and that is element of, uh, uh, of the placebo control, which is typically something which is associated only with clinical studies. The reason why we're not doing a clinical study is purely financial. It would be extremely difficult to get the money together. The good news is, is that there are some other people who are doing uh, uh, sort of like more classical controlled clinical studies or microdosing. But the downside of those studies is that they have a very, very small sample size, like 20 or 30 participants. That's the typical number. So basically, that means is that uh, many of these studies are statistically fairly underpowered. And in contrast with that, we are going to have a very large sample size and this element of placebo control. So, uh, you know, our study is uh, about microdosing and many people get caught up in that. And But the real innovation is really this, this new methodology, this self-blinding methodology. And uh, as far as I know, like this is novel, not just within the uh, framework of psychedelic science, but more generally within uh, medicinal research as well. Uh, obviously, I cannot be a hundred percent sure about this because just the medical literature is so vast that uh, you know uh, I cannot claim that with a full confidence. But uh, we tried, you know, to look around, and we haven't found other people using this study design when voluntary participants implementing their their own placebo control. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the gist of the study. Oh, okay. So what is like the because I, 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 I signed up for the, the study and um, I'm going to uh, start doing it the first week in, in August. And w- I didn't notice on there, you know, that there's a there is no like suggested dosage range. So what do you suggest for anyone that's going to participate in it as a dosage range? So actually, we, we say in the manual that you should dose with the dose that you would use outside of the study as well. And this is a decision that we have wrestled a lot with. Uh, obviously, like, you know, it would be ideal, you know, if everybody would take the same dose. Like, scientifically, that would be beneficial because that would el- eliminate one variable. But in the end, we have decided against it for two reasons. And the first reason was is that uh, before we officially launched the study, we ran a, a, a small-scale pilot study. It was just basically 10 people, 10 microdosers who we met through uh, various internet communities. And like in that first version of the protocol, it was fixed at uh, 50 micrograms. And you know, some people complain that they like to do it higher. Other people uh, like to do it with lower dosages. Uh, so then, you know, we did not want to be too restrictive about it. We were afraid that we are probably going to lose some potential participants. You know, if we try to uh, tell you too much uh, how uh, you should microdose. So that is the reason one that we wanted to be open and capture sort of like microdosing you know, as a set of practices. And this is something which uh, you know going to come up, I think, often in this conversation that microdosing is not like a well-defined uh, uh, practice, whether we should think of it as a set of related practices. Yeah. So anyway, that's reason one. And the other reason is, is, is that even if you would define that, let's say you should do it with 50 micrograms, uh, people are just not going to be able to do that. And that is because you cannot know how much LSD is contained on a blotter without expensive chromatographic uh, testing. And then even, you know, if let's say that you have a, a sheet of LSD and then you send in one tab for testing, then it is not guaranteed that the tab next to it is going to have the same amount. So, you know, we could, you know, tell people to aim for 50 micrograms, but it's, it, it, we know that people just would not be able to do that. That is only possible in a, in a clinical setting. Yeah. Uh, so then, you know, it would be hypocrite, you know, for us to, to try to, to define it. There was actually a version of the protocol in which we uh, try to try to introduce drug testing. Uh, there is actually a lab in Barcelona called Energy Control, and what they are known for is that uh, 
As far as I know, this is the only lab that operates internationally and anybody in the world can send there any drug sample and they are going to test it for you with uh, professional quality uh, chemical analysis, um, the so-called chromatography uh, technique. And this is really the only technique which can really tell you, not only can confirm that there is LSD on the drug tag, but also tell you the exact quantity of it. So we had plans like that, but uh, there was uh, uh, some difficulty because then, you know, the samples would have to cross international borders. And uh, probably you can see that that would lead to a lot of uh, legal complication in implementing it in a, in a study. And also it is fairly expensive. It costs, uh, uh, I think it's 70 euros, so about 80, 90 US dollars. And, you know, we felt that would be asking a little too much uh, from the participants. Um, but let me also add here that with the Imperial team who are working on this, we are going to launch a study probably towards the end of the year together with this laboratory in Barcelona. And it, the study is going to be crowdfunded, so you're definitely going to hear about it. But what we will want to do with the study is that people who are sending in their LSD blotters, we are going to cut up those blotters into smaller pieces to microdoses. And what we want to study is this distribution of the LSD among the different doses. Because right now, as I'm sure you are aware of, and the listeners are aware of it, like many people are uh, doing volumetric dosing because they do not trust that sort of in the, uh, uh, identical sized pieces of the blood are going to contain uh, identical amounts of LSD. Like sort of like that's the assumption when people are cutting up the blotters. But there is really no hard data to back it up. On the other hand, uh, it is probably going to be fairly evenly distributed, but nobody knows for sure. So we are going to have a study on that, uh, which we are going to crowdfund, uh, as I said, towards the end of the year. So anyway, like that is also like you know, some of this interesting side story that came out uh, from designing the, the self-blinding microdose study that we realized that there is really no data on this. And we will definitely want to have, uh, go to the... Uh, uh, um, to the bottom of it. Yeah, I mean that's I've I've microdosed with LSD and and I did the volumetric like you were saying, but but also like you said, I, I don't know what how much was in the, you know the 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 blotter that I put in there. So it's like I've just kind of a, a made an assumption whenever I've microdosed with LSD of like this is I, actually I tell myself milliliters instead of micrograms. You know, it, it seems to be other people that are interested in how many micrograms are in each dose when I talk about it, you know, on online or on, in podcasts or videos or whatever. But yeah, it's, you know, I, I also kind of almost have a problem with the term microdosing nowadays because one person's microdose is some, you know, and the, the spot they're trying to get to is a lot more than, than, you know, I've read about as, what a microdose should be. So for, for this study, like you're, especially since it's a placebo test, you're, you're wanting subjects to get to a sub perceptual threshold, correct? Well, so not uh, like we are more interested in, let's say, detecting that threshold. And there is obviously going to be some personal variation in that. And one of the advantages of us not defining that, how you should microdose is that, we are basically going to be able to have a plot in the scientific publication, which is basically going to be that on the, you can imagine it that on the x-axis, it is going to be what is the reported amount of LSD taken. And I would emphasize here the reported amount, which is probably not going to be the, the true amount, but uh, we're going to treat it as a proxy to the true amount. And on the y-axis, we are going to have is the, uh, the number of correct guesses. Because uh, during the study, at the end of every week, we are going to ask the participants to take a guess which days were microdose and which days were placebos. Uh, so, you know, we are taking this guessing rate as a function of the dose. And obviously, we would expect that as the dose is getting bigger, people are going to become better guessers on average, just because, you know, the, the higher the dose, the more obviously it is uh, uh, not going to be a placebo. Obviously, go to like a... 50 micrograms, I think that is a dose which uh, 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 could be very routinely distinguished uh, uh, from the placebo. 
But that being said, there was some done like in the golden era of psychedelic research in the 50s and in the 60s where, uh, you know, they have done these uh, placebo control studies with macrodoses, not just with microdoses. And there were some uh, surprising uh, results. So one of my favorite study actually from that era was uh, from uh, Abrams of 1955. And uh, what they did is that they first assembled uh, a questionnaire. I think it had 20 questions on it. And this questionnaire was designed to detect uh, whether people uh, think they are on LSD or not. And then they gave basically people uh, placebo. They told them that they're going to get LSD, but they gave the people placebos. And uh, there were 33 participants. And uh, then they went through this questionnaire. And almost about for every third question, people answered with yes. So, you know, people got confused about the placebo versus the LSD, even though in this case, it was an experiment about macrodosing. I think they were told that they are going to get 100 micrograms. So, like, you know, these effects of perception have been very intertwined, you know, with the history of uh, psychedelics research. Uh, Actually, uh, this is going to be a, a direct quote from this research study, from the Abrams of 1955 study that I was quoting. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I was just working on a presentation, so that's why it's right in front of me. But the quote is, a direct quote, the subject had such a severe response to the placebo that considerable care was required to maintain an experimental situation that was not traumatic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and another quote from the exact same paper it was found by us that for a given group of individuals, suitable evaluation of response to LSD-25 could not be made without the use of a non uh, of a zero dose control group. End quote. So, like you know, this sort of like that placebo control is really essential for psychedelic studies. This is right there from the beginning of psychedelics research. And you know, if you think about it, it's probably no accident that this is the era from which the notion of set and setting has emerged. Uh, I think it was coined by uh, Timothy Leary. And, uh, you know, like, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, the set and setting theory first is that the, the psychedelic experience is going to be profoundly impacted by the, the mindset and the setting, which refers to the, the physical environment. And, you know, both this notion of set and setting theory and both the, the placebo effect, I think they are just really two sides of the same coin because. Both of them are about how uh, mental expectations, intention, and the uh, sociocultural setting of the experience modifies that, that drug experience. But this is right there in the DNA of psychedelics research. And again, even when we are talking about macrodoses, I imagine that if you take you know, like only 10% of the doses and make it just sort of like on the edge of uh, perceivability, then obviously those mental expectation effects are not going to become uh, 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 sort of like a less pronounced. They're going to be even more important. Uh, so that's why we think that the, the placebo control is really the key to understand uh, uh, microdosing. It's, it's, it's very hard to separate fact from fiction without the placebo control. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if you've ever heard anything from um, Dr. Andrew Weil. He's he was a student under Timothy. I, Leary. I, I do know him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've heard him talking about just in medicine with the placebo effect and that it gets kind of written off as like, oh, they're just, you know, it, it's it, it's all in their head or whatever. And he's like, you know, we tend to as a society overlook like the, the word placebo just, you know, is, is synonymous with fake. And, and that's not it, um, you know, that we need to look at that, why some people, you know, whether it's psychedelics or, or some sort of other pharmaceutical, why people get the desired effect when they haven't taken the, the, the drug and that, you know, what does the placebo effect show for the power of the mind, you know, especially with not just with the psychedelic experience, but with, you know, anything you're trying to cure or, or manage some disease, you know, why are we overlooking the fact that apparently our mind is able to, you know, take over for what the drug does as well? I think that's a very good point. And actually, there is a movement within sort of like standard uh, westernized medicine to take the placebo effect uh, more seriously. There is a, oh, what's his name? Uh, I think his name is uh, Ted Kapchuk, who is a very interesting guy. He's right now a tenure professor at Harvard. 
but he's uh, I don't think he has like he, he doesn't even have a master's or a PhD. He was uh, somebody who was very interested in uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And I'm not sure how we ended up with being probably one of the most well-known placebo researchers in the world. But anyway, he's, he's somebody who very strongly pushes this notion that so the placebo effect is our friend in medicine and, and we should use it and we should embrace it and, and learn how to get the, the strongest placebo effect from, from various people. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, this is something which is definitely gaining traction within uh, the scientific community. And I should add that probably for the reason is that there has been a, a, a deafening silence of innovation within psychopharmacology. Uh, we are sitting here in the middle of a mental health epidemic. And since the introduction of the SSRIs in the 80s, there really hasn't been like any exciting development uh, when it comes to the treatment of uh, depression, anxiety, and uh, these, uh, 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 the diseases of the modern age. And I think the community got to a point where it is like, you know, why not try, you know, these uh, uh, um, hippie technologies? And I mean that in a positive way now. But I think, you know, what I mean is, is that because of the lack of innovation coming from standard lab techniques, I think the, the community is opening up because there is an obvious need and, uh, 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 and the placebo response could... Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that is not something that should be looked over, but something that instead should be embraced and, and used for the benefit of the patient. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask, too, because I, I plan on doing the the study with uh, mushrooms. Yeah. Have you seen in the results so far that you've looked at, or do you expect to see any difference between results with, with plant psychedelics or, or blotter psychedelics? So I haven't started analyzing the data formally yet. I'm going to do that towards the end of the summer. Uh, but anyway, to your question, I, I don't really expect there to see any significant differences. Like generally, I am a believer that what you can do with mushroom, you can also do with LSD and vice versa. Like these substances, when you are talking about their pharmacology, they're very, very similar to each other. Uh, like, you know, the experiences are also very similar. I think the, the most important or the most noticeable difference between these experiences is that LSD is much, much longer. Uh, and, and, you know, that's what makes it, I think, that, uh, easily distinguishable from, uh, from mushroom. Uh, but I think, you know, you know, not just in the context of microdosing, but in terms of, like, you know, large dosing psychedelic therapy, uh, I would be surprise you know that for uh, the vast majority of cases you could not use either uh, LSD or uh, mushroom. That being said when I talk to some of my friends who are like underground psychedelic therapists like uh, we, we, I had a very interesting discussion about it actually just the uh, the other day that uh, you know often underground therapists you know recommend mushroom or LSD to their patients based on their preconceptions. Like for uh, somebody like me, who is, uh, uh, you know, I'm a scientist myself, and uh, I'm also coming from a, let's say, a very science-y family. Uh, to me, like, you know, LSD is more resonant with my personality, with my cultural background, because I'm coming, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, um, from a, a family of university professors in Eastern Europe. But, you know, for somebody who is, let's say, you know, uh, very interested in, Eastern philosophy and is more as, a, let's say, a spiritual person. For them, probably mushroom is a, a lot more resonant with. And then probably the therapist would go, you know, with the mushroom. Like probably, you know, either substance would work. But depending on your personality, you know, either mushroom or LSD could be an easier sell, depending on how you are thinking about these two substances. And this, again, ties back to this placebo or uh, yeah, the, the placebo-like expectation effect that how that is going to modulate the uh, experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've microdose uh, with both quite a bit. And what I've personally noticed is it's harder, even if you have the exact same weight every time with mushrooms, it's, it's not going to be, sometimes it's going to be too much and sometimes it's going to be sub perceptual and, and, and that can be the same weight all across the board. But that being said, having too high of a microdose with mushrooms can be 
you know, pleasant. I mean, it's not much different than, you know, being high on marijuana or something like that to where that in between of a macro dose and a micro dose of LSD, I find kind of unpleasant. And so, Mm -hmm. and just my personal microdosing usage, I really don't microdose LSD anymore for that fact, just because if I don't get it right or the day's not right, like it's just a, an unpleasant time, you know? And so, I mean, that was one reason that I was going to do the study with mushrooms because I want to get to the sub perceptual, but I don't, if I don't get it, like it's, you know, I don't know, it might be, it might be good for the data, I guess, but (laughs) for me, (laughs) for me, it's kind of like, uh, I don't really. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And at this point, just let me slip into the conversation that, so the study, we originally designed it with uh, uh, people doing it with uh, blotter based LSD. Like that's, you know, what we had in mind. But uh, the study also can be done with uh, volumetric dosing, and it can be run with uh, also can be done with mushroom or uh, plant-based psychedelics. So you know, if uh, just wanted to get the word out about it as well. Basically, for the volumetric dosing, uh, what needs to be done is is that instead of the capsules, uh, people need to get uh, these plastic vials that can hold the liquid, and then obviously for the placebo, you are just using the same liquid in which you dissolve the, the LSD blotter, but uh, obviously without the uh, uh, blotter. Uh, we needed to make that change because the capsule would not hold the liquid, it would evaporate, so uh, uh, hence the vials instead of the capsules. But basically the setup process is, is the same. And when it comes to mushrooms, then there is also an additional step compared to the blotter base. And that is because most people are doing microdosing with mushroom with uh, something like 0.1 grams. And if you hold a capsule that has 0.1 gram mushrooms in it versus an empty capsule, then you can easily distinguish those based on their weights. So then basically the placebo capsules need to be filled with something of an equal weight, which is non-psychoactive. Uh, so anyway, just uh, letting people know that uh, both volumetric dosing and mushrooms can be used, but the setup process is slightly different. But we have separate uh, manuals, both for the mushroom case and for the uh, the LSD case. I mean, the LSD manual, there are the separate instructions for volumetric dosing. 95% of the setup process is the same in all cases, but there are just these uh, uh, some nuanced uh, differences between them uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Yeah, I was I was um, I was going to ask you that too. I for the placebos with the mushrooms you know, I kind of foresaw a problem that I would have in that even, you know, to, to know if it was a placebo or not, when I take a mushroom capsule, uh, a microdose, like I still taste the mushroom and sometimes have like a mushroom burp. And like, I was wondering, do you think that I could use in the placebos? I have like, um, you know, a non-psychoactive mushroom powder, like for, uh, you know, like a immune boosting kind of stuff. Um, so it's a very, very good point. And actually, uh, it's funny because I just got an email from another participant also saying that the, the mushroom verbs can give it away. <laughs> so you know, this is something that probably you're going to have to address. And yes, exactly. Like uh, basically uh, powdered mushroom, non-psychoactive mushrooms are the better uh, feeling material. And we are, we are about actually to, to change the, the protocol. Uh, most people are doing the study with, with LSD and stuff like that's our, our target audience, but we also want to get the, uh, the mushroom right. So, uh, yeah, thank you for bringing it up. We're going to definitely make that change. Yeah. Yeah. That was just something I thought of. Um, and then, so we had another question from the discord that I thought was interesting and, and sure. do you have an expected difference in, you know, in this study, it's a different protocol from what most people follow James Fadiman's microdosing protocol, which is a one day on two day off kind of rotation like that. And then yours is different. Is there a reason for that? Or do you expect a difference? Well, between- so actually it is, it is, no, it is very much based on the Fadiman protocol. It is also one day is on two days off except for one week. And that is on purpose that there is one week or let's say one possible week because you might not get this week in your actual experiment when it is basically a microdose and off day and another microdose and that is very purposefully put in there because we want to see if there is a greater cross tolerance uh, if you're just having one day of as opposed to two 
But for all of the other microdose weeks, it's basically uh, microdose day, two days off microdose. I got you. Uh, but it's very much uh, uh, inspired by the Fediban protocol. Indeed, we have been in touch with him, designing this study. He is not directly involved, but he's certainly a, a friend of the study. And uh, he helped us to get participants. And, uh, you know, he's somebody who uh, obviously inspired this research very much. So, uh, you know, we are uh, all great up to him uh, in that. Uh, yeah, so we, we have like only this one occasion or like one possible occasion, and it's going to be just the microdose of the microdose. And uh, yeah, we are just interested to see whether the guessing performance on those second days are going to be worse compared to the standard case where there are two days of the microdoses. And that is scientifically an interesting question because as you may know, LSD and psychedelics in general have a very strong short uh, cross tolerance, meaning that let's say you take LSD, uh, let's say uh, 150 micrograms, which is roughly what most people do recreationally. Then if the next day, if they would do the same dose, then the effects would be uh, uh, minimal. They would be still able to uh, feel it, but probably they would need to take close to 300 micrograms to get the same effects as the 150 micrograms they did the day before. And this is an interesting property of psychedelics that they have this very strong but short-term tolerance. Like basically the brain recovers in a day or two, but uh, uh, you know this is just something which uh, adds to the... Uh, uh, one more fascinating aspect of psychedelics. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it is it is pretty cool, and that's that's one reason too. With my own microdosing, like I've kind of stopped doing any sort of regimen. I found that you know I would end up like if it wasn't a day that would be a good day to microdose or to to at least like kind of you know appreciate it the, the different head state that it can put me in. I, I like taking it more as needed, which could be weeks or a month apart, you know, but like, if it's a day that I'm going to have the house to myself, but I don't want to, you know, take a full dose of, of psychedelics or can't, or, you know, I only have a couple hours or whatever, and to just be creative or go for a walk with the dogs and just kind of enjoy it. I find that uh, more enjoyable for me. I also end up taking probably a little more than a sub, you know, <laughs> perceptual dose in that case, but. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So like, you know, in terms of the study, one thing you know, which I should also probably mention is that the way that the study is structured is that the dosing period itself is four weeks. Uh, the study itself takes longer because we are taking some detailed personality measures both before, after the dosing, and one month after the dosing has been finished, um, the, the so-called long-term follow-up. But the dosing period itself is uh, uh, four weeks long. And uh, I mean, I understand that you know why people would prefer you know, to have only specific days to microdose, but we needed to give it more structure in order to, uh, you know, structure the data set and make it uh, more analyzable in a scientific manner. That being said, it uh, as we say somewhere in the protocol that uh, you know if uh, there is a good reason that you don't want to take uh, a microdose in a day and you want to have a day off, that's fine with us. If you know you don't take the capsule, just please let us know. Like, uh, you know, just uh, I, today somebody emailed me from the study is that he's going to have a very important meeting at work and he wants to make sure that, you know, the uh, acid is not going to kick in when he is having his uh, carrier deciding chat with the boss. <laughs> and that's completely fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, just just do let us know because uh, we are going to mark that in, the, in our database that, uh, uh, you know, that data capsule was not taken. And then, uh, you know, we can uh, take that into consideration during the analysis. So we, we tried to be very much flexible with the study. We did not uh, want to be like too rigid because uh, we felt that too many people are going to be turned off by that. And uh, in particular, we, we understand that this study requires some effort. Like the, the setup process takes about 45 minutes and like you need to spend about 20 bucks on the components that are needed on the envelopes, the zip bags, the gel capsules, so on and so on. So we know that, you know, we are asking people a lot of effort and, uh, you know, we, we felt that, you know, if you would, you know, be very uh, restrictive then in how you can micro those, then it would turn away much of the community because we knew that it's more likely that people who are going to do this study are people who are already micro dosing. And because of that, they probably already have that preferred way of microdosing in terms of the, the, the dosage and the frequency of use. So that is why, you know, we are basically having a, a, 
you know, uh, a, a bit more hands off uh, than a clinical study. Uh, so uh, something which I should also mention here is that so you know, we talked about the schedule of the study. So in the protocol, we are giving you uh, sort of like a standard schedule, which is based on this Fadiman schedule. But you can also construct your own, and we give you instructions how you can modify that standard schedule to be something which is more uh, in line with how you would like to microdose. Uh, so that is also just something for uh, the people to know who are, could be potentially uh, interested in the study. That uh, you know, if you if you want to do microdosing three times a week, you can definitely do that within the study. At the with the standard schedule, it is basically two times a week. If it happens to be a microdose week. Because of course there is always a possibility of a placebo. Yeah. Are you, now I haven't taken the first uh, questionnaire. Um, mm-hmm. Are you collecting like age and taking that into account as a variable? So yes, we are collecting demographic information and uh, and things like age and uh, you know drug use history and um, so yeah, I think like one of the key questionnaires which you're gonna then complete soon at the baseline is uh, uh, what is uh, sort of like your attitude towards uh, psychedelics. And obviously expect that for many, many people, you know, that attitude is going to be positive. Yeah. Uh, but that is, you know, it's going to help us to make an important point. And that is that, you know, be, you know, as we discussed, like the placebo effect is not about the sugar pill. It is about your expectation and mental preparation for whatever treatment you are undergoing. Yeah. And there is a very strong selection bias when it comes to microdosing. And it is exactly because who are the people who are microdosing now? It is people who probably already have experience with psychedelics, probably positive experiences. And that is the reason that pushes them uh, towards microdosing. Also, you know, microdosing is currently not evidence-based. Uh, you know, it is, it's, it's not going to be prescribed by the doctor. It also involves uh, illegal substances in most countries. Yeah, for you know, people who are microdosing you, I think it is a fair assumption that most of them are really expecting some benefit in return. Yeah. And this expectation of a benefit combined with the fact that microdosing on just this um, edge of perception, that is like you know the perfect storm for a strong placebo response. So that is why you know it is a uh, uh, you know not just us as the research group, but the entire scientific community is very uh. uh uh, you know, keen, you know, to have more placebo control studies in microdosing because uh, placebo control is generally needed for something to be uh, uh, considered uh, uh, up to the standards of modern uh, medicinal research. But especially because of the circumstances of microdosing, because of these very low doses and the self selective nature of the people who are microdosing, it is, it, it is really uh, the number one uh, question. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I doubt you're gonna get any subjects that are like, I hate drugs, I hate microdosing, yeah. I, you know. Yeah, I mean, every, yeah, every, exactly, everyone's exactly. gonna want to report positive. <laughs> yeah. So. I, yeah, and like you know, that's like you know, part like you know, the way that we phrase it is that like, uh, it is a hundred percent sure that placebo-like effects are going to play a role in uh, the benefits of microdosing. There is no question about that. What is really the question is that you know whether it is something which is uh, sort of like the there's an intrinsic physiological effect of uh, microdosing that pushes people towards good mood and better cognitive performance. So, like, you know, certainly there is a placebo effect going on. But the question is, is that, you know, sort of like the effects of microdosing surpasses the placebo effect or not. And, you know, that is really uh, what we are after. It's not, you know, whether microdosing is placebo, really. It is like, you know, sort of like, placebo is included in the act of microdosing, so to speak. Yeah. But, you know, when it comes to the outcomes, you know, when it comes to like your mood and your cognitive performance, you know, it's, is there something more, you know, than just, you know, that, that perceived coolness of microdosing? Like, uh, it, there was somebody who emailed me is that uh, he had a few questions about the studies and then, uh, you know, when I answered him and then he wrote it back and, oh yeah, I'm so excited. I can't wait to tell my friends about this at the next dinner party. <laughs> And like, you know, I just smiled inside because like, you know, this sort of excitement is obviously good, you know, but this is again, you know, going to drive you towards that feel good. Like if you're that excited about something, then obviously it is going to make you, uh, then it's going to be easier for that thing to make you feel better. Yeah. 
Yeah. I actually have a, a, a like an anecdotal story here is that uh, when we did that uh, sort of like pre-launch uh, pilot study, which I have mentioned earlier, it was uh, eight people involved. And we had like a little chat group going on. And then, you know, we had like, you know, the setup party and everything. And it was like, everybody was just like super excited to get going. And uh, I remember we had this setup on a Saturday and the experiment starts on Monday. You always start it on Monday. So there was this Sunday and like people, you know, were just like, oh, can we not start it on Sunday? Like, come on. Like, you know, everybody was like so pumped up. And in this chat group on that first week, like at least for one day, everybody was like, oh, guys, it's it's a microdose, 100 percent sure, 100. And then, you know, then the experiment was over. And then once it was over and then we unblinded out of the eight people, only one of them had a microdose actually in the first week. But, you know, it was just that 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 excitement, you know, that, yeah, we are microdosing, you know, da, 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 you know, that's just ended up to like everybody uh, being pricked. And, uh, uh, you know, it is, uh, it's fascinating to see that. And uh, I, I, as I said, I haven't started analyzing the results yet, but something that I can add here is that uh, people are not very good guessers. They don't have a formal analysis yet, but, uh, oh, yes, this is something I should also add, that if uh, people are doing the study, then uh, once you, if you complete all of the questionnaires, then we are going to send you back a report about your performance. So after you finish the long-term follow-up questionnaire, then you are going to get this file which tells you that how have you have guessed for every day for this four weeks long dosing period and what was really in your castle and some statistics, you know, about your guessing accuracy, so on and so on. So anyway, like, you know, and, and, and the cognitive performance scores as well. So uh, yeah. we think, you know, that is uh, like a good feedback for the participants and also that's, I think it makes it much more uh, interesting for the people to, uh, you know, play along in this guessing game because then you're getting feedback. You're gonna you're gonna get to know your score. Uh, so anyway, but what I wanted to say, so I am like, you know, sending out these reports, and I haven't done formal analysis, but like, you know, people just uh, barely get more than 60, 70 percent of the the capsules right, and obviously there is going to be a dosage variance, and uh, you know. Uh, it's sad like this is not a formal analysis, but just you know, seeing many of these reports, like uh, you know, I, I I don't think I've seen anybody who was like above ninety percent or, or something like that. So I think you know, even for like seasoned microdosers, there are going to be days when uh, you know they are going to be at least unsure, you know, whether it is microdose or not. And, uh, like there was this guy, uh, a German guy, and. Uh, he, you know, he wrote, uh, I sent him back the report and then he basically didn't believe it. And then he was like, are you sure, you know, and then maybe I screwed up, you know, the experimental setup. And the way the study, uh, and then, you know, I told him is that then just go ahead, you know, and, and open up your unused envelopes. And then indeed, you know, he find the correct number of microdoses in the capsules that he did not use, sort of like confirming that uh, those days were really placebos. And, uh, there has been at least like four or five instances like this where people just didn't really believe, but then, um, you know, they open up the, the remaining capsules, which they haven't used, and they find everything that uh, they thought that they consumed. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm, I'm interested to see how, how well, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, you know, but, you know, something which needs to be added here is that, of course, you know, people who are taking the larger microdoses, then, you know, probably this is going to be a less... Uh, uh, pronounced uh, uh you know these these surprises but uh but as i said like you know we definitely want to have in the in the uh, scientific publication this figure of the guessing performance versus the dose and i think that's going to be a super interesting figure to look at yeah yeah no for sure i i, I uh i can't wait to see the results how many uh, subjects have you had so far do you know uh, I, I can't say that like sorry i can't say numbers oh, of yeah. the study because right. it is still running but uh you know, in terms of like, uh, but what I can say is that this is probably going to be the largest placebo control study on psychedelics ever. Uh, but that being said, like, you know, it is, uh, that's not very hard to do. And that is because it's very expensive to do studies with psychedelics uh, because they are Schedule A substances. So like, you know, actually the, the really the innovation of this study, as I said, it's, it's really about this methodology because what we can do with this self-blinding study is to have a study that is super cheap to run 
and it's cheap to run because we are not giving out that rock. And because of that, it is going to have this very large sample size. Basically, we have managed to figure out this um, study methodology, which combines a placebo control with a high sample size. And that's why we are very excited about this. And obviously, the reason why it is cheap, that they're not giving you the drug, is also some of the uh, Achilles heels of the study, because that means you know, some lack of control over the, the drug quality and the quantity and uh, you know, I, we often say that, you know, this is admittedly not the best imaginable study of microdosing, and um, we are very upfront about the limitations. But whether, you know, what this study we hope is going to accomplish is to basically accelerate that process from, uh, or, or accelerate, you know, the collection of evidence from the current, like, anecdotal level of evidence to professionally run clinical studies. Like, whatever we found, it needs to be confirmed with better controlled clinical studies. But if our study finds strong evidence in favor of microdosing, then we're going to have a very good chance to be able to go to the major scientific funding agencies and say that, hey, we did a placebo control study with lots of people and there is an effect. Give us money so that we can get to the bottom of it. Yeah. Uh, so, like, you know, there is constantly, like, you know, this play between, like, you know, money and sample size, like, you know, that tends to be the uh, still very important parameters in every study. And we, we managed to find, you know, basically combining a cheap, cheap study with, uh, with a large sample size. And that's why we actually want to do a lot more with this methodology after uh, the study yeah. is over. And so, and as far as like a, a clinical study that is providing the, you know, accurate dosage and the same material and stuff like that, like that requires a lot more money too, to get like a license to have the schedule of one drug that are, you yeah know. oh yeah yes oh yeah 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 exactly like it's not like as you know and probably all of the listeners know lsd is a really cheap drug most psychedelics are very cheap uh like you know typically you can get a hit for like 10 15 dollars or something like that you know and that's basically good for a night uh the reason why it's expensive is because of the the regulation around it and then, you know, you have to pay for a license, you know, that has to be then, uh, you know, I think here in the U.S., like, and the DEA has to be involved and, you know, they, there's have to be some safety mechanisms is that nobody is going to, uh, 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 you know, steal some of the drug. Uh, but that makes it expensive. It's not that producing LSD is expensive. It is just the regulation around it makes it expensive. Yeah. And now as being someone in the psychedelic research community, do you think that it's those regulations that are the most prohibitive or is there, you know, are most of what I'm getting at is, is most like researchers willing and wanting to do more psychedelic research and the regulation holds them back or is it like you're on the fringe element of academia um, if you're wanting to research these drugs? So right now we're in a moment where uh, we are, I don't think it's fringe anymore. Actually, I think like psychedelics reach that point where basically everybody is aware of them. It is this new exciting thing. I think, you know, this completely turned around in the past, uh, you know, 10, 15 years or so. I, uh, you know, somebody from Europe, I feel that, you know, in, in Europe, psychedelics never had as a negative image as probably here in the U.S., like, you know, in the uh, just say no era or so. But also right now, probably the high is not so high because, you know, that there hasn't been this, this massive shift in the perception of uh, psychedelics. Uh, and also, I think, you know, something which uh, needs to be added here is that, like, uh, like, you know, here there was a whole counterculture movement in the 60s. And, you know, the generation who were like the hippies, you know, today they are the CEOs and the executives and, you know, sort of like at the prime of their career. But, you know, in contrast, in Europe, there wasn't that strong of this counterculture movement. Like, psychedelics were much less, you know, part of, um, you know, of the narrative of the 60s and the 70s. So, like, uh, you know, and in particular for people behind the Iron Curtain. So I'm from, I'm from Hungary. So uh, I, I was, you know, born in the Soviet Union and, uh, you know, part of it. So, like, you know, and for example, my parents, you know, they, they didn't know anything about psychedelics because it was just so not present behind the iron curtain that, you know, it, it just didn't en enter that uh, public consciousness in a way. 
and like you know it's 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 getting there now but right now because of all of the map studies and uh you know all of the things that uh, you know some of my colleagues are doing at imperial college it is getting there in this very uh positive light uh but we didn't have to overcome you know a lot of that uh uh uh, you know, they, they just say no era, which was here in the U.S. Yeah, yeah my um, my uncle, uh, he's he just retired, but he's a research psychiatrist in, at, at a university. And um, he, I think, I want to say it was maybe five to ten years ago, he, he did some research, a clinical study with MDMA when they just started doing it with, like, PTSD. And um, he was reunited for that study with like a mentor uh who was in like undergrad and they were talking about it and he was like you know in when when mdma was first getting before it was made illegal and we were doing research with it the psychiatric world at least in 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 uh the us the the, the psychiatric researchers they were just they were like, we found the drug we've been looking for forever, you know, and and they were so heartbroken that it was made illegal and it had to go underground. And and um, he said it was like kind of a touching moment of like th- like the last thing that his mentor did was this research project, and he finally got to like take part in in you know see where it was going. And and uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to see how it's just kind of picked back up. But you know, psychedelic research whether it's MDMA or OSD or, or, or mushrooms, um, you know, it really went through that dark period, like you said, and, and I really think it's taken up steam now. And, you know, it's, it's great to see. Uh, I just, I wish the money was following it as well. And not just the, the willingness, you know? Oh, actually I think the money is coming. Like, you know, you know, like I, even I get, you know, like a lot of emails, you know, from people who are like, uh, um, let's say more motivated by money than by uh, you know doing good science, uh, but I think you know there is a, a feeling that uh, a psychedelic gold rush is coming, and uh, it is actually something which I'm uh, have mixed feelings about. Even just within the world of microdosing, uh, you know there are some people who are uh, financially benefiting from the hype, and uh, you know probably um, you know they're sort of like. Um, Adding to the hype at this stage where there is no sufficient scientific evidence and also, you know, their their motivation is, I think, more financial than, you know, getting to the to the bottom of what is really microdosing doing. So anyway, I think, you know, this is on one hand, you know, exciting because, you know, it's, it's just a phase, you know, that we have to get through. But like right now, you know, I see a lot of activities, which is sort of like the, uh, you know, the business side of psychedelics is developing. And I think in this early stage, I think there are definitely, uh, um, unfortunately, in my experience, there are some some uh, uh, comments out. Obviously, I'm not going to name any names on the show, but, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, trying to, but, you know, just just uh, um, be aware of that phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But like in you know, in terms of like you know the doing the like the professional research, I think you know it is really uh, there are two things which are going to happen within the next five to ten years, and one of them is when MDMA is going to be legalized through in the U.S. and uh, you know by the, the MAPS trials, mm-hmm. and the data from the phase two trials are so promising that I don't think that there's really any question that it's. Uh, not going to happen, which basically have to go through the phase three, collecting more data. But then after that, it is very hard to see how not that could be going. And the other one is, uh, you know, there is a very large scale uh, uh, mushroom study uh, for depression undergoing with some uh, private investors involved as well. And that is going to be a huge, huge study uh, in terms of the sample size. And uh, it's, you know, like uh, uh, that's going to carry a huge weight of evidence. And I think, you know, once those two things and, you know, let's say that the mushroom study is going to work out for depression, which uh, like there right now, like scientifically speaking, uh, depression and mushroom, there is much less data available than MDMA and PTSD. The data that is available is very promising. And, you know, just based on the research that was also done in the 50s and in the 60s, I would say that it would be surprising, you know, for uh, the mushroom therapy not proven to be useful but at this point you know that's uh, still a possibility uh, i think you know with the mdma like phase two just knock it out of the park so much that uh, um, 
uh, I don't think that, uh, 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 that that would be very hard to imagine. But anyway, I think like, you know, these two events, you know, uh, after that, I think, you know, the walls are going to fall down. And uh, I think uh, there's a good chance psychedelics are going to be rescheduled or just uh, research then is going to be uh, made much easier in terms of the some of the regulatory hurdles uh, and then you know after that there's gonna be the probably you know the bigger test beginning is that how we are integrating psychedelics into mainstream society obviously there was also a project of the 60s I think it's fair to say that it uh, failed uh, you know hopefully we're gonna be smarter about it in the second time around yeah well and I I also you know as we've seen with um couple cities in the state so far i i feel like uh with mushrooms they're kind of like following the path of cannabis and just because of their relative uh you know natural um kind of state and then also just how safe they are like it it almost seems like they're just going to be legalized even before the the research is in you know i mean um maybe uh it's it's going to take a while to to be able to be like a licensed therapist to use them but as far as like personal use and and cultivation and stuff like that i mean it seems like the the tide's turning there quicker than than uh than i thought it would i i, I think the medical use is gonna come first and like very mind in oakland and in colorado it was mushroom use was decriminalized so like you know yeah. you're still not allowed to to grow your mushroom and i think you know like you you, you, you would not be able to do that without changing federal regulations yeah uh, like obviously i'm not an expert you know in the legal side of it but, uh, like, you know, I would have a hard time seeing that. And, and I think, you know, it's going to be the same as with the cannabis is that the, the medicinal use is going to come first. And, uh, you know, that's going to soften up the ground enough that, uh, you know, uh, that basically uh, uh, it can be also used in a recreational uh, manner. Yeah, true. And, you know, just something which I also want to slip in here is, is that, like, you know, right now we are talking about MDMA and mushroom, but, you know, like LSD is basically left out of this conversation. There is very little medical research going on with LSD. There is some, uh, uh, in particular, uh, by Matthias Lichty in the Switzerland, but, like, you know, in, in this era, it seems to be that mushroom, you know, is the preferred psychedelics, and I think that is because LSD has picked up a lot of bad press in the 60s, and then, you know, and then also, you know, like that organic being, you know, such a buzzword, like, you know, mushrooms also being uh, a natural product, you know, they are much easier to sell to the public, you know, than the evil synthetic LSD. Uh, but like, you know, uh, there is actually a, a very big uh, uh, difference in the research activities around mushroom and, and LSD. But I think this is just purely for these uh, uh, political reasons and, and the narrative, uh, not because... Uh, mushroom would be superior to LSD. Yeah. Now, wasn't there, though, before they made LSD illegal, wasn't there a lot of medical research that was already done, uh, you know, in the that kind of window when it was discovered and before it was made illegal? Oh, yeah. That, that, that was a huge rush to study LSD at the time as well. And, uh, like, actually, what many people don't realize that what so for how LSD made its name is that uh, obviously it had this very profound effect on brain function. And then uh, people notice that how similar it is chemically to, to serotonin. And that, you know, basically opened up the door to really study the brain as a neurochemical machine like lsd was like one of the strongest examples is that how strongly chemicals can influence uh, 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 the brain and that led you know to this notion of uh, receptors in the brain so a lot of uh, you know the standard terminology that we use today in modern neuroscience is actually coming from research in that era when people noticed is that how similar is lsd to serotonin which is a, a naturally occurring uh, molecule uh, but one of the things which uh, needs to be said here is that the research that was done in that era, it, it tends to be like uh, not well documented, just simply standards of scientific reporting very different 50 years ago uh, compared to today. So, you know, it, it, is, it is hard, you know, to get a lot out of that literature just because uh, 60 years have passed and uh, the standards of uh, uh, scientific evidence have uh, you know, moved a lot in this era. 
And because of that, you know, it's hard to take that research that was done in the 50s and in the 60s and apply it directly uh, today. Yeah. Uh, like, for, for example, it comes out very nicely is that there's actually a, a fairly new book on microdosing, the science of uh, psychedelics microdosing by uh, Thorsten Pessy, who is a German professor. And he did an extraordinary work of uncovering all of the work that was done in that era on uh, low dosages of psychedelics. And like, you know, very often, you know, if you read these books, then, you know, you say, is that, oh, yeah, but it is unclear how many participants were, or, you know, it is unclear what exact questionnaire was uh, used to assess this or that aspect of the drug, and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, it was just a different era. So, uh, unfortunately, there is a limited how much we can uh, 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 transfer from that. Huh. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I wanted to also ask you, I don't, I imagine you had seen this article. It just came out a couple days ago about the, uh, some primary or preliminary results of the clinical trial from the University of Chicago. Have you seen that? No, but I've been traveling the past few days. So like, uh, you know, I haven't done my internet catch up yet. Oh, I got you. Yeah. I mean, it, it basically said that the, you know, now this was a clinical double blind placebo, um, with uh, 20 participants and it basically showed that there was no difference, but that possibly a negative, um, uh, uh, what did it say? Something about like they had a less than like positive uh, response to positive images. I, I don't know. It didn't really say what, like what their actual thing was, but it's, it's been kind of funny because depending on what the headlines are, um, or what you know? What website the the uh, the article is from? Like it'll be like study shows negative results of microdosing, or the the next one will be like first results are in from microdosing. Like here's the research coming in, you know. And it, it, it's just kind of funny to see the the clickbait article spin on stuff, you know. And, and the reason why they get away with that is exactly because of the low sample size. Like you know, even with I was seeing this particular paper, you mentioned is that there was twenty participants. So likely, you know, there was, you know, some uh, movement in the positive or negative direction of some of the scales, but likely the effect was not statistically significant. And that's why, you know, it is easy to spawn it, you know, one way or another. So, you know, that is why, like, you know, sample size is so important when we are talking about these studies, because you need to have a fairly large sample to have basically clean results from a statistical point of view. If you are having 20 participants in any study, then you, you basically need to have a very strong effect to show a difference compared to baseline. There is generally just a, obviously I don't want to turn this podcast into a, a mass lecture, <laughs> but uh, the, the larger the samples, uh, so the larger the effect size is, the smaller sample size you need to sort of like clear the bar for statistical significance. And this notion of statistical significance is under siege for very good reasons today. And uh, I don't want to go there, but uh, let's just take it you know, as a proxy for a true effect uh, for the sake of simplicity. But anyway, for smaller, uh, for smaller effects, uh, the way that you can show it, you're going to need a larger sample size. You know, what we are studying here is called microdosing. Like, you're not expecting these gigantic effect sizes. Like, uh, 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 you know, I, 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 I wouldn't be, uh, you know, surprised to find that, you know, the 20 uh, participants, you know, they, they cannot claim anything uh, to be significant. Uh, it's, it's just it's just a very low sample. And especially because likely that was uh, split up into multiple groups as well, like the placebo group or probably multiple uh, uh, microdose those groups. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and it's, you know, out of just the short little blurb they have of those articles, it's like, you can't really make a judgment either way. And it's just so funny that, you know, depending on what the target audience is of the article, what they're going to just, you know, glean from it when it's, it really doesn't even say anything, you know? Yeah. And also it's like, like I've seen this before that like, uh, the uh, Polito paper came out, which is is a a researcher in uh, Australia, actually, I think. And uh, he had a paper coming out. I think it was either late last year or early this year. And it was like this uh, sort of like this internet-based survey study, but uh, he didn't have the placebo control. So, you know, that is basically this uh, cross-sectional non-control study that is something which in uh, science, you know, we would uh, say that, you know, it carries a low way of evidence. Like, uh, I think, you know, it's a good paper and it was 
good that it was done, but I'm also sure, you know, that the authors would agree that, you know, it is not, you know, having a, a, a decisive evidence about microbiome. But anyway, like, you know, there were many new sites that reported that this is the, like the, the first rigorous research is, is in on microdosing and it, uh, and it works. And, uh, no, it's, it's not like it's, a, 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 it's not a paper that is going to be uh, decisive. Like, this is something which, uh, you know, probably should also add here, uh, which, you know, when I talk to people about science, uh, I think it's often misunderstood that, like, different studies have different qualities based on their methodology, like not all scientific studies are, are, are or equal. Uh, a double-blinded, randomized, controlled study is going to, uh, you know, worth much more than a collection of case reports, which is what basically this internet-based uh, survey studies is. So, like, you know, in, in, in science, you know, like, typically, and especially when it comes to human subjects, you know, it is rarely that you have a decisive study, whether, you know, there are multiple pieces of evidence with, um, you know, multiple upsides and downsides of uh, every study, and then, you know, you, you have to add them up somehow, and uh, it's always going to involve some judgment. Uh, but anyway, the, the point is, is that, you know, this is, uh, you know, whether microdosing works or not, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a while until we really get to the bottom of it. You know, as I said earlier as well, like, you know, if we would have infinite resources, we could have designed a study which is better than what we have, but, like, you know, we are, uh, you know, we live in the real world, and, you know, we have to take very much into consideration the, the resources that we have. Like, you know, this study, you know, it's going to, at the end of the day, it's going to cost less than $10,000, which I know it sounds cheap, and it is really, really cheap for a scientific study. It is, it is basically nothing. Uh, uh, you know, we, because, you know, the, it's an imperial study, and Berkeley Foundation is behind it. Like, you know, we often get confused, you know, for, like, this well-funded research study, but... No, it's really not. Like we, we don't have any grant money out of it. It's basically a passion project between myself and a, and a few people at Imperial College. Uh, like uh, it, yeah, in particular, I, I should really mention David. David Eriksson so is my main collaborator on this, and uh, David Knott and Robin Carhart Harris, who are also involved with the study. But uh, yeah, the vast, overwhelming majority of the work is done by me and David on a voluntary basis. We don't get paid for it. We are doing it for the for the love of science, really. Yeah, you you mentioned the just right now the passion behind it and doing it, you know, voluntarily. And I just wanted to ask what you know what piqued your interest in the beginning with psychedelics. You know, are there any experiences that guided you to this point in your life? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there is some of that involved as well. Uh, but like, what was really the uh, so actually it was in 2016, I was towards the end of my uh, PhD, and then uh, a friend of mine who is working in drug policy, then he reached out to me regarding an article which was about cannabis. It was published by a guy in Hungary uh, who is actually a very well-known uh, cannabis researcher, and uh, there was basically a study which was very negative about cannabis in its conclusions, and he asked me you know, to look through it. Uh, you know, whether, you know, or do I have anything to say about their, uh, whether, you know, the conclusion is solid, has uh, basically asked me to help him to better understand it. And that's when I really got into the drug literature. And what we found actually with this study, that if you look at the supplementary material, then it was an experiment that was done with mice. And the amount of marijuana that the mice were given were just, uh, extremely big like uh, because mice metabolism works different from people it's actually kind of hard you know to say you know that how much the mice took in human terms but if you take everything like all of the known factors into consideration then basically the mice were smoking about six grams of 20 percent oh, EC cannabis <laughs> which is so like, the mice were snoop dog <laughs> yeah, basically exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly 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 and, uh, and, you know, these are mice who were not exposed, you know, to cannabis before, like it took a mm -hmm. while, you know, to get here, you know, it is very different, you know, if you start, you know, from a, 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 a novice baseline. But anyway, like that was like, and then I actually met the guy, you know, the, the researcher, and I raised this point with him, and he somewhat actually agreed, you know, and uh, we had actually a very good chat with him, and uh, actually stayed in touch since, and then... Uh, 
we actually did, uh, and then I started, you know, to look for the same thing that you know how drugs are being studied in uh, sort of like the scientific literature and compared it how that is being used, and then basically, I, you know, did similar uh, or this investigation in the context of MDMA use. And then I went to a psychedelic research conference in 2016, and I was just having a little poster presentation, you know, on some very preliminary results. And the, the funny thing is, is then, you know, there was a guy coming up to me, and then, you know, we started to talk, and then, you know, I criticized many of the papers, and it turned out to be that he was one of the authors of those papers that I was actually criticizing. And uh, that guy is actually this, this David Erizzo, who is uh, right now my main collaborator at Imperial College. And that's how we started working together. But he agreed with my point, really. So actually, uh, he helped me doing the MDMA study. We, we published it uh, when it was actually last year or the year before. Anyway, so and and then and then uh, and then once I had this idea for the South Bible study, and I emailed him, he took it off. But yeah, so it was like a series of events. But it started really with this, uh, you know, like analysis of uh, dosage and. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get into MDMA too much, but like what we found with David regarding MDMA, that if you compare the uh, number of ecstasy pills that typically people are taking who are enrolled in neuroimaging studies, that is 720% more than the typical MDMA ecstasy user uh, takes. And then we show with some, uh, uh, do some analysis as well that the variability of the MDMA content of ecstasy pills really cannot cause this gap. So, like, you know, basically people who are studying, who we are studying as ecstasy users are taking seven times as much as the average user. So, like, you know, there is this extreme bias, you know, in who we are studying. And I think to some degree that's fine because you want to see like a, a big effect. And that's why you're recruiting people with a high dose level. But then that should be also part of the interpretation of that data. That we, uh, you know, we looked at something with very high level of ecstasy users, and but then that shouldn't be confusing you know, with the average ecstasy user. So yeah, anyway, that's that's what we found. And actually, we have some plans to extend sort of like that methodology and look at it also for uh, cannabis, amphetamine, uh, cocaine. Uh, Methamphetamine, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, yeah. We have, <laughs> we have way more ideas than time to implement. Uh, yeah. This is this is one of them. <laughs> well, and doing it voluntarily too. I'm I'm sure you you have other things on your plate as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right now this microdosing study is uh, you know really took over my life in a way. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it is it is something which. Um, you know, when we started, like, we were not even sure, you know, that is going to be uh, uh, approved by Imperial College. It took us a long time, you know, to, to get here. And, like, you know, when, we, when me and David started to really design the study and work on it, there were no guarantees that it's going to work out. And, uh, like, you know, we started it back, like, in 2016 towards the end. No, sorry, two th early 2017. And we're going to have the scientific paper out probably, like, early next year. So, you know, it, it's like, you know, it didn't happen overnight. Like, you know, there was, uh, this is years of work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing all this heavy lifting for all of us. We, we <laughs> all really appreciate it, man. Uh, I wanted to ask, though, um, you know, people are definitely starting to understand that to really see these laws change, they have to be helping out these researchers. And I was just wondering, you know, how else can people become active in, in that and, and provide data for these types of studies. Is there a resource people can start uh, accessing to to learn more about this? So actually, it's a, thank you for the question because we are thinking of uh, launching something like a virtual lab or an organization, uh, which is probably going to be called Drug Nerds Lab. And what it is going to be is basically a collection of experimental protocols for people who are using drugs in a recreational setting. But, you know, during that drug experience, they can do something for five minutes, then that is going to uh, contribute to science. Oh, uh, nice. So, again, this is something, you know, which is like uh, sort of like, you know, on my to-do list. But, <laughs> you know, just uh, during this show, you know, I have mentioned at least four or five things. So I'm not sure, you know, when we're going to get to it. But this is something that we're definitely thinking about because, 
like even when developing the cell blinding microdose study, like there are a lot of people who are not academics, but very knowledgeable about these substances. And uh, like something that we really want to do with David is to be more engaged with this community and collaborate with them and, uh, you know, do it in a way that's uh, mutually uh, beneficial. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we are hungry for that knowledge that people have accumulated who are very active psychedelics users and you know, to basically channel their experiences into scientific data and like this study is a very good example of that like you know right from the beginning we've worked with microdosers uh, specifically with the there's a microdosing community in the netherlands microdosing.nl and they have been very active super supportive great guys and like you know we we ran them through you know the pilot test they provided really useful feedback we had way more uh tests in the early protocols than currently today and they warned us that, hey, it's going to be overwhelming for everybody but the most dedicated uh, microdosers. So we really cut back on the number of tests uh, and the time commitment that the study requires. But, like, you know, we, we needed their feedback in order to, to get the, the study design right. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, that was just, like, another good sign, you know, that, uh, you know, we should really continue in this direction to, to you know, get to know these guys even more and, and, and uh, work with them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I, I don't think we really have any more questions for you. Is there anything uh, else you wanted to add about about the microdosing study? Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just uh, so I have some notes in front of me. Let me see if I mentioned everything. Uh, I think you know, we probably went through you know, most of it. Um, probably I should just add that so the, the study is going to be probably open until the end of October. It could be later as well. We are a little bit unsure when to close the, the when we are going to close the, the data collection phase. And uh, but anyway, like you know, just want the listeners to be aware who are potentially interested that like you know, if you want to participate, then uh, you know you, you, you are going to have time basically until October. So there is still a, a few months left. Uh, but you can also always check our website, uh, selfblinding microdoseorg for uh, all of the latest information there. Uh, and then just one more thing is then, so the, as I mentioned before, the scientific publication is going to come out probably early next year. So, you know, we get a lot of questions uh, from the media and from other people that, um, uh, you know, when the results are out. And uh, yeah, that's, that's early next year. Awesome. We'd love to, we'd definitely love to have you on and to discuss the results. Definitely. Too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. But yeah, th I mean, thanks so much for coming on and, and, uh, it was great talking to you and I'm, I'm glad that I'm going to, uh, you know, be taking part in this and I definitely urge everyone else that that's listening to, uh, you know, if you can, um, uh, and you feel like throwing, throwing your data in the hat to go ahead and do it. And, and like he said, you know, they they, uh, it'll be ending in October, and don't forget it's a nine-week study, so you, you have to start before October. So the, 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 the so way we are going is that we want to close it at the end of the year, so the last point when you can start is October. Oh, so, I got you, uh, I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah but uh, yeah, exactly. We basically, uh, I, I want to submit the paper before the end of the year. I got you. So yeah, anyone uh, anyone listening or that saw the video, definitely uh, sign up and, and, and throw your data in the in the ring, too. Um, and if you guys have any question, I mean, the listeners, then uh, microdose-study at protonmail.com. Uh, it's also on the website. Just, uh, you know, feel free to ask questions. We know that this study requires some effort for the participants, and we are really committed to make it easy as, uh, as we can for you. So, you know, anybody has any questions, we are happy to respond, and uh, don't be shy. As always, thank you for listening to the Help Find the Others podcast. Please don't forget to check out our Discord server to connect with our growing community. The link to join can be found in the description. And if you feel like donating to our channel to help us grow, a link to our Patreon can also be found in the description, as well as some cryptocurrency wallet addresses. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast or have any questions about these topics, please email helpfindtheothers at protonmail.com. If you would like to leave a voicemail, or a text message question for a future episode. Stan, what's that number again? 567-233-1335. Okay, guys, thanks again. And until next time, let's help find the others.